colleagues are in the graveyard today. As a matter of fact, last December, some of you were privileged to travel home. And those who could not travel had phone calls in relation to, how are you? Happy Christmas, happy this, happy that. By the time you ask, what about so so Mr. so Ah, he died last year. Oh, what about so 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 Ah, he's in the hospital in coma. What about so 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 Ah, he's mental. Mad. That your life does not mean you are more righteous than those who have gone. But God chose to find you worthy before Him by grace. Stretch your hand and bless the composer of that song. May the Lord bless him. He may not know, he may not know that he was inspired to put up that song. But I'm here to let you know that that is an inspiration from God. It's a song of thanksgiving. To who God to meet you again and again and again. But there are certain songs you will sing and God will leave his throne on your behalf. Yeah? David sang and God left his throne on his behalf. To the extent that those who thought he was a sinner ended up offending God. Because God declared him a man after his own heart. Wow. Thank you, Choristers. Thank you. God bless you. And thank you, members, for supporting their inspiration. Because they can't just come out and start singing to empty chairs. You're able to dance, worship, wholeheartedly. That was why they were inspired to go on and on and on and on and on and on. And on. Wow. Clap for Jesus Christ once again. Eh? Yes. With due respect, you may have your seats. I wouldn't want to take much of the time. Because we have lots, lots, lots in store by the special grace of God. And uh, as usual, I want to prepare your heart. Like I told you, whatever message you receive from me is based on personal experiences.
If you ask me based on my little experience, based on my little spiritual maturity, because I always want to be humble to who God's attention the more. Based on my little experience and my little spiritual maturity, if you ask me the simple definition of God, I will tell you that God does not necessarily favor the smartest. But he convincingly favors the available. That you are very smart, very educated, does not mean you can receive of God. But making yourself available, God opens his arm to welcome you. To make yourself available is to spread out your arms as a helpless being, asking God to lift you up. That was why Jesus made that comment by saying, if the real children of God refuse to serve God, he would raise up stones to worship him. Wow. Now I'm going to take you through a brief message, very short. And that message is titled, There is Power in Obedience. Tell your neighbor, there is power in obedience. Yes. I will explain what I mean by that. And as usual, I will give you some books to back up this brief prophetic message based on personal experiences as a young boy in the things of God. The first book I will declare to you is the book of John, chapter 14. And you get to you take your reading from verses 23 to 24. And if time permits, we'll go through it. And for proper comprehension, you can take from verses 1 to the end in your privacy. And after that, we'll look into the book of First King, chapter 2, from verses 1 to 3. And after that, we look into the book of Job, chapter 36, from verses 11 to 12. And if time permits, we look into the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 15, and verse 22. And also, if time permits, we look into James, chapter 2, and verse 23. Also, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, take note of verse 6 and verse 8. Hebrews 11. Verse 6 and verse 8. And also, the book of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. And Exodus, chapter 20. Verses 1 to 17. Remember the message. There is power in what? Obedience. But let me just take you briefly through... Deuteronomy chapter 28. Are you there? Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 1 to 14. I 
I'll just take verse 1 and 2. Perhaps when you get home, you can take from verses 1 through the end. Because of time, I will not be able to read all. But there, the subtitle there says, Blessings for Obedience. If you fully obey the Lord your God, look at the word there, fully, not partially, not occasionally, not at your will, not anytime you are ready. Because when you think you are ready, God may not be ready then. So you must always make yourself available. I start from beginning again. Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verses 1 to 14. Let me take briefly as far as I go. From verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all His commands. Take note. Obey the Lord your God and carefully follow His commands. I give you today. From beginning again. I always want to go slow and steady so that you, you flow along with me. Because the way I was brought up, I'm made to understand that all fingers are not equal. A good teacher by grace should make sure he carries everyone along. Our fingers are not equal. Deuteronomy 28, from verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. Sometimes we read the Bible, we don't pray for divine interpretation. Raise you high above all the nations on earth. Amen. Who is the owner of the earth? Amen. Eh? Amen. God Almighty. And who was sent down from heaven to die for your sins? And after his death, he resurrected in, after three days, isn't it? And ascended into heaven. Who is now governing this earth? Eh? Governing the earth. Eh? Eh? Okay, I will open your understanding. When Jesus Christ fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, lo and behold, who came before him? And what was his second temptation Satan presented? Uh, can somebody come and answer the question? Be bold enough. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He said, if you, you will worship him, bow down to him, he will give him the whole earth and all that's in you know, the place. Say it loud again. He said, if you bow down and worship him, he will give him the riches of the earth. It means by wickedness Satan is governing this earth and by righteousness God Almighty is the creator you understand when you are reading the Bible ask for divine interpretation by wickedness Satan governs what and by righteousness God is the creator that's what the Bible says that God Almighty is the creator of all but well, he's not the father of all. Are you there? Uh -huh. So, that is why God promised you here. He will give you, let, let me take it again so that you understand when you obey God, the kind of power he will give you, blessing he will give you, that will be above all nations on earth. Do you understand what that means spiritually? It means you live to stand above human destruction. Above spiritual destruction. 
And who is the destroyer? He rules the earth by wickedness. Though God Almighty is the creator of the earth by righteousness. You don't read the Bible by letter. You read the Bible by divine interpretation. Listen, where you know that God, when you obey the word, God gives you power above the earth. Above Satan himself. If you fully obey the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 28 from verse 1. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today. The Lord your God will set you high above all nations on earth. Verse 2. And all these blessings will come on you and accompany you. Look at the condition there. <clears throat> Look at the condition there. If you obey the Lord your God. That's the condition. From verse 3 are the blessings. When you get to me, you read. For that obedience is my concern. Because that is the area we are lacking. And that is the only way Satan can come in. When you see disobedience, you see Satan. When you see obedience, you see who? God. There are two parallel lines that can never meet. This one is going that way. This one is going that way. In between them now is amazing grace. Amazing grace says that the disobedience if ready can be made obedient by grace. <clears throat> Let me take you to John chapter 5. <clears throat> John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Are you there? When you get to him, you take your reading from verses 1 to 14. But I want to read briefly the area that will lead us to the very message. There is power in what? Obedience. John chapter 5, from verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gates, a pool, which is, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Verse 3. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. Take note. The blind, the lame, the, par the paralyzed. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Verse 5. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Are you there? Yes. Instead of the man to answer yes, he started narrating the stories of discomfort and pain. I'm taking it somewhere. Simple. Yes, sir. I want to get well. Or, it's not your business. But look at what he said. Sir, the, inv the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is seared. Is that the answer to the question? No. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. He was complaining. Isn't it? Later, I will take you to somewhere. But let me go to verse 14. Take note of that portion there. 
when Jesus asks you, what do you want me to do for you? Sir, I've suffered so much. My family members are mocking me, making jest of me. Is that the answer? I want healing. I want this. I want this. But I suffer so much. People are making jest of me. Anywhere I go, they may just ah, is that the answer to the question? But the Bible says Jesus still attended to him. I will let you know the reason. Now verse 14 of John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Let's go to verse 14. Okay, for proper comprehension, let me take verse 8. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. If Jesus was to go by his attitude, would he receive his healing? No. I'm taking you somewhere. Now, after his healing, Jesus later found him in the temple. And let's see the warning Jesus gave to him. Later, that's verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. If you go through the book of Exodus chapter 20 from verses 1 to 17, you will, you will understand the commandments you and I ought to obey totally before we can maintain whatever we have received from him. And Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verses 1 to 14 clearly states the blessings of Abraham. Now write this down. Many often say Abraham's blessings are mine. Yes. Abraham's blessings as clearly stated in Deuteronomy chapter 28 from verses 1 to 14 are mine are yours if and only if we are ready to obey God's commands as clearly stated in Exodus chapter 20 from verses 1 to 17. There is power in obeying the word of God. I mean, there is power in obedience. When willingly carried out, not under compulsion or under a condition of heart desire and want. I repeat. There is power in obedience when done willingly Not under compulsion, not under duress, not by force, and not based on her desire or want. Why? Because it is very common for you and me to promise heaven and earth, to promise to obey God, to promise to serve God, 
to promise to follow God all the rest of our lives when in want of one thing or the other, when sick, when poor, and when relegated to the back seat in the society, you can open your mouth wide enough to promise heaven and earth because you need something from God. Oh Lord, anyone from now there will be prayer line. Oh Lord, if you use wise man Daniel to heal me, I promise to serve you all the rest of my life because there's cancer on your leg. If you hear me through wise man Daniel, I promise to serve you the rest of my life because you are looking for a baby. Because you are looking for a job. Because there's a divorce letter issued by either your husband or your wife. You can promise anything just because you are in want of one thing or the other. But that does not mean you willingly want to. You genuinely want to. But condition you find yourself force you to make that lip service to God. But when that obedience to God's word is unconditionally carried out by you, no matter the situation you're going through, I will serve you, Lord, no matter the situation. I will worship you, Lord, no matter the situation. I will obey your commandment, no matter the situation. That is when God Almighty, in His amazing grace, will come true for you. God says, Thou shalt not worship other gods beside Him. You are coming to Sunday service, even as the message is going on, you will be busy pressing your phone, chatting with your business partner. And the Bible says, Where your heart is, there your treasure is. And where your treasure is, there your heart is. It means at that moment, at that point in time, that gadget has become your God. That text message you are sending has become your prayer point. Not sent to God, but sent to a human being like you. Tell me how your prayer can be answered. The Bible says, I am a jealous God. I need your full attention when worshiping me. It means there is power in that obedience. When you obey that word in total, completely, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Amen. Because the blessings of God will follow immediately. There is power in obedience. Just as there is healing in obedience. There is power in obedience. Just as there is deliverance in obedience. There is power in obedience. Just as there is security, protection in obedience. A good example, you had a revelation. God showed you clean clear. My son, don't go out on a Wednesday. Stay indoor and worship me. And God did not say more than that just because he wants to fight that battle without telling, showing you how he fought the battle for you. Because sometimes when God shows us how much he's fighting for us, we become so proud that we enter the hands of our enemy. We we'll talk too much to the extent that we we'll reveal our secret to the hands of our enemy. So there's anything God will do on your behalf that will keep it away from you. But he show you a sign that he's fighting for you. Oh, my son, my daughter, don't go out on Wednesday. Stay indoor. Worship me. Sing praises. Worship me. Before you know it, Satan will come in with his deceptive nature. Ah, 
Thank you, Lord, for revealing this to me. Thank you, Lord, for revealing this to me. Thank you. Before you know, grand, grand, hello, Mr. John, how are you? I'm fine. That container you have been praying for, for the past two years, has been released. And he needed to come today, Wednesday, to sign the document. <laughs> Jesus, oh. imagine somebody go say, My son, my son, my son, don't go out on Wednesday. There is power in obedience. Take notes. Before you know it, you say, ah! for the past two years, I've suffered. Hmm. You'll come back again. Are you sure the container is out? Send me text message. Send me picture. You send me a picture. You are forgetting the message. The next you say, ah, Lord, I know you reveal to redeem. I know you allow me. I promise you, just 10 minutes. In fact, I will not talk to anybody. I will just drive in and drive out. I will make sure nobody talks to me. I will close my mouth. Just permit me to go and sign this document. And you forgot in last week's message that when good is on ground, evil will come. To confirm the genuineness of that good. There is power in obedience. The moment that temptation comes and you dash out of your house, don't be surprised that you may not be alive to come back. That's exactly, that's exactly what Satan wants to achieve. What do I mean by there is power in obedience? If you obey that word, protection follows. That's the power in obedience. You can't expect God to do all for you. He has his own role, which is intact. A good example. What, why are we talking too much? A good example. Let's take the case of our Savior when he was born. He was born where? In Bethlehem. Eh? Speak louder. I don't want to be the only one talking. Let's, let it be interactive. He was born in where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And what was the message that came concerning what King so 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 Herod wanted to do? Can somebody come and answer that question? What was the message that came to Joseph and Mary concerning the child before the decision by the enemy? Uh -huh. Okay. Ah, you only want to ask me a question here. Uh -huh. Okay, sir. The message that came, sir, is uh, the Spirit of God told uh, Joseph to take the baby, you know, uh, they should take the baby and uh, flee from that particular place because Herod is seeking after the you know, child to kill him. There is power in obedience. The question you need to ask yourself is that is it not God that sent Jesus? Why didn't he start from heaven and say, hey, Pharaoh, Pharaoh? And Pharaoh will collapse and die. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, my role makes God's power come true for me. My obedience makes God's power God's anointing, God's grace, come through for me. So you, <laughs> God loves me so much. You know, I like, you know, most of you are fond of quoting the scriptures. We see your charisma. The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. He makes me go out beside the sea. No weapon from me shall prosper. Hey, you demon on the way, I will crush you. You are forgotten. That there is protection in obedience. There is power of protection, security in obedience. The moment Joseph had that message, he knew that there is power of protection in obeying this word. He stood, took his wife and the baby and flee. And what happened afterwards? Calamity. It means if Joseph had not obeyed the word of God, perhaps there would be salvation for you and me today. Will you not say God is not a God we should worship? Will you say God is partial? No. God is the God of absolute democracy. 
He gives you the freedom to choose whether to obey Him and receive His blessings or to disobey Him and be handled by Satan, who is the ruler of this earth. That is a typical example for you to know that if that could happen to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who are you? If you forgive those who have deeply offended you, I will raise you high above all nations on this earth. It means there is power in obeying that word. What this man has done to me over my dead body. In fact, if I see him coming, if possible, I will disappear. I don't want to set my eyes on him. I don't want to see her. I am bitter beyond measure. It means the blessings attached in obeying that word, forgive, will not be part of you. Can you see the way we read the scriptures upside down? Tell your neighbor there is power in obedience. A good example. Let's come to the secular world today. As it sees in the spirit, so it is in the physical. If you take too much sugar, you have diabetes. If you take too much sugar, you have diabetes. Stop taking sugar. Stop excess sugar. When you disobey that instruction, what will happen to you? You get you have the diabetes. Don't, I'm telling you the secular world, the law. Don't take alcohol. If you take alcohol, you have liver problem. You have kidney problem. Don't take alcohol. If you smoke, you have cancer of the heart or lungs. The next thing you want to do for excuse to do that. I just need one stick. After one stick, I will stop it. I just need to take one bottle. After one bottle, I will not do it again. Many have gone to the graveyard just for asking for once. One bottle, one stick. Those who are living a healthy life today, call them closely and ask them, what is the secret of a healthy life? They will tell you categorically clear that there is power in obedience. Now, the question you need to ask yourself now is this. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 6, only faith pleases God. Then what becomes of those men and women of little or no faith at all? Now, we are coming back to John chapter 5 verse 14. From verse 1 to 14. And I told you we are coming back there. I repeat the question. The Bible says that there is great or greater anointing in the presence of God. But we all are commanded to use our faith to put a demand on the anointing, isn't it? Now, if we are to use our faith to put a demand on the anointing, the question now is, what about men and women of little or no faith at all? Let me take you back to the reason why God has brought men and women of uncommon and exceptional grace. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me take you back to that John chapter 5. Are you there? Are you there? Let's read from verse 1 again. And here, whether this man really expressed faith in Jesus Christ or not. And yet, what happened to him? That's to let you know that 
Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, listen to this, I write it down. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the domain, the source of uncommon and exceptional grace which he has willingly shared with men and women today who are ready to learn at his feet. What is the meaning of uncommon and exceptional grace? That is the kind of grace that can plead on your behalf so that you can be healed and blessed. Now, let's go to that, our uh, brother. Now, John chapter 5 from verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festival, verse 2. Now, there is in Jerusalem, near the sheep gates, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by the five covered colonnades, verse 3. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One, verse 5. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Can you imagine? And when Jesus asked him, what do, you want to do, what do you want me to do for you? I'm supposed to jump in. Ah, master, rabbi, I want to be healed. Please, I believe you are the healer. But look at. Huh? From verse 5. One who was there had been invalid, had been an invalid for 38 years. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Look at the man's response. Verse 7. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool while the water is there. Just like many of us today, do you want to be taken out of poverty? In fact, this poverty is a traditional case in my family. My brother is poor. My father is poor. Everybody is poor. People are making just of Is that the answer? But man of exceptional grace intervened on his behalf. Interceded on his behalf. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. When the water is shed, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Verse 9, At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. It means, Men and women of little or no faith, can receive from God Almighty the moment they encounter men and women of uncommon and exceptional grace here on earth. But there's one thing they cannot do for you. They cannot help you to maintain what you have received. That is why I see some people at the prayer line, whether you believe or not, whether you have faith or not. In the name of Jesus Christ. It means that man of God is a man of exceptional grace. Uncommon grace. Who has the capacity to add to your faith. The measure of faith that can make you receive. Believing that after that, you will follow Jesus Christ along the road. After Jesus Christ cured the man, look at the area he made him to understand that, look, my friend, I have played my part as the source of exceptional grace on this earth. As the founder of exceptional grace on this earth. I have interceded on your behalf. But look at the condition Jesus gave him to maintain his healing. John chapter 5 verse 14. Verse 14. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you.
This is, I'm saying this because many of us, you end up losing your blessing. And then you say, the man of God, I pray for you. Ha, you don't know that place, you receive blessing, and the blessing did not last. This and that. Listen to the reason. Perhaps you have encountered a man of uncommon and exceptional grace who has the capacity to add to your faith, who has the grace enough to add to your faith so that your faith will get to that measure of faith that can receive from the throne of grace. That is the role they have to play. After that, maintaining what you have received is your own business. That is why the Bible says to receive blessing is not as difficult as to maintain it. Jesus found you at the temple and said, Look, I have pleaded on your behalf for you to be taken to the corridor of blessing. By my grace, you enter the corridor of blessing. You didn't merit it. But to maintain this blessing afterwards, go and sin no more. It means the power in obedience maintains our blessing. Such is the case of many of us that will be testifying today. You have met a man of unique, uncommon, and exceptional grace who has interceded on your behalf to say, God, bless this man. I am sure after blessing him, he will follow you. Bless this woman. I am sure after blessing her, she will follow you. They have played their role. After receiving that blessing, it's now up to you to maintain that blessing. That is why the Bible says to receive blessing is not as difficult as to maintain it. Because men and women of exceptional grace, exceptional grace, uncommon grace, unique grace, are waiting for you to receive. But they cannot be there to maintain that blessing for you. It means whatever you are going to receive today, or whatever you might have received today or before now, can only be maintained based on your obedience to God's command and total submission to His good and perfect will for your life. And Satan is waiting for you at your disobedience. Satan has nothing on you unless you disobey. That's why the Bible says you need God more. What's the meaning of what Jesus Christ told that man, the invalid man that was made whole in John 5 verse 14. See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something else may happen to you. It means you need God more in this blessing, in this healing than when you were sick. Why? Because Satan is waiting for you at your disobedience. Satan has nothing on you unless you disobey God. We understand there could be trials of faith, tests of faith, well known to God. If that test of faith is based on God's consent, I mean, God is fully aware of that test of faith. That test of faith will not bring you down, but rather you will learn the necessary experiences and maturity to move on in life. And when you have learned that enough experiences and maturity, God will put an end to that test. Finally, that you are a child of God, a genuine Christian, a bona fide member of the household of faith, does not mean that your obedience will not be tried by Satan. He's always there to make you disobey God so that he can come in. The only way that power in obedience can become powerless is when you disobey. As long as you keep obeying the word of God, keep doing the will of God, keep moving closer to God, there is power in obedience. And the security of life will continue to be your portion. May the Lord bless His words.
out. I've been talking and talking and talking since. When I'm not microphone. Eh? When I'm not, uh, is this speaker? Eh? Yes, I've been talking and talking and talking and talking. Now it's time for you to talk. What's the educators? What's the take home? There is power in obedience. Okay, please come forward, sir. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Today's message, I just look at it as if it was directly to me. I have to speak. My name is Broslin Zarmi. I am from Nassau State. This message was just directly to me because I noticed it. The moment you receive blessing from God, especially, let me take example from me. Man of God here delivered me one day, and okay. the rule point of contact, God used. Okay, uh -huh. I'm sorry. Point of correction. Yeah. God used. Uh -huh. God used the very man of God here to deliver me one day, and. Almost all those things, in fact, all those things I was passing through went away. I was good. I was anxious to read my scriptures, doing things of God. One thing I want to testify to us here that this message, we need to take it serious because I'm, taking, I'm talking from experience. For example, my handset I was opening my Android phone through this phone I was captured again there are things I begin to watch on my phones which I believe does not glorify God and one thing with devil I notice the moment you view something that belongs to him on phone you will see that you will be anxious to watch it at that moment. Things of God, you won't, your mind will not be there as before. Clap for Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let me just buttress what you're saying. It's like you are praying, you say, Lord, catch all my soul for your glory. Are you there? Lord, catch all my soul for your glory. And your soul can only be captured for the glory of God through obedience to his commands. Anything that does not glorify God, don't view it. Your soul will be captured for your glory. There is power in that statement. It means you continue to work stronger. If you are sleeping, you are thinking about God. If you are moving, you are thinking about God. How do you see some people that each time you hear them talk, they sing praises? Each time you hear them talk, God bless you. When you say God, you are stupid. Even when you use the name of God to say God punish you, they say God bless you. Because their soul is captured for the glory of God through obedience. On the contrary, if you get to disobey God's word, your soul will be captured for the glory of Satan. It means anything about God will be out of your heart. And you begin to glorify Satan. That is when you see somebody who does not go to clubhouse, start going to clubhouse. That's when you see somebody who does not listen to worldly music, start listening to worldly music. That's when you see somebody who is trying to pray, start sleeping. That's when you see somebody who you message about Jesus, it's as if you are telling them about James Hadley Chase, Miss and Booth, all those comics normally read. Attention will no longer be paid to the things of God because your soul has been captured for the glory of Satan through disobedience. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And one thing I've noticed is that the moment you are captured for the second time, the grace for you yourself to go back to God again may not be there. You will struggle. Try to go back as when you were delivered that time. You won't, your strength will not be able to fight that temptation again. It will increase, increase, increase at the end of the day. Even to go through your Bible again would be a problem. You won't have time, and sometimes you look at the Bible, it, you hate it. The moment you are looking at the Bible, those things 
your watching will begin to come to your mind before you know you wouldn't even know when you've gone back there again you begin to yes, struggle let me explain further sir there's what we call hard, hard drive you know what they call hard drive in computer yes, eh? yes. you know you have hard drive in your memory yes. eh? where you store what you have seen many years the day that hard drive is crashed that's when you cannot remember anything again but Satan is so clever that you make that hard drive very intact in disobedience. You went to here, I will praise him from everlasting, everlasting to everlasting. You open up the hard drive. And you need to play back those things that cannot glorify him so that you will not start glorifying God. But when Jesus comes into your life, he will crash the hard drive of evil. And restore a new memory for the glory of God. Uh -huh. So indeed, 